Welcome back. In the last session, I looked at the profitability of companies globally in 2019, fully aware that those profit numbers are going to be upended by this crisis. My argument for looking at profitability and growth pre-crisis was that companies with high growth, high margins, and efficient investment pre-crisis are better positioned to make it through the crisis and prosper in the post-virus economy. In this session, I'd like to focus on another aspect of companies that will determine whether they survive and make it to the other side, and that is how much debt they have. All else being equal, the more you have borrowed, the more at risk you are of not making it through the crisis. So when we look at how indebted companies are across regions, across sectors, and perhaps use it to draw some conclusions about what kinds of companies you should be betting on for the turnaround when it does come. So let's look at the trade-off in debt. There are some reasons given for the use of debt that are really not good reasons for borrowing money. One is, borrowing money will increase your return equity. That is technically true, but a higher return equity by itself doesn't mean much if it comes with a higher cost of equity. It is also true that debt is technically cheaper than equity. After all, the lenders are first in line, the equity investors are last in line, but that doesn't make your capital any, any cheaper. Your cost of capital will not get lower because you're using cheaper debt, simply because you're parceling off the risk in the business to the equity investors. The arguments against that sometimes are based on false premises as well. One is if you borrow money, you will have lower net income. That is actually true. You have interest expenses that will lower your income. But remember, when you use debt instead of equity or fewer shares outstanding, your per share earnings could still be higher. Your ratings will drop as you borrow more and more money. Your default risk goes up. But that again means very little because ultimately it's your overall cost of capital that matters. Here are the true trade-offs on debt. The big plus for debt is a tax advantage. In much of the world, interest is tax deductible, cash flows to equity are not. The higher your tax rate, the greater the tax benefit to debt. The big cost for debt is you're going to be exposed to bankruptcy and distress if you borrow too much. I don't even have to tell you that risk is rising to the surface, but those are the big pluses and minuses of debt. There are, my, there's a, there, there are some minor pluses and minuses. In some companies, borrowing money can make managers more disciplined about the kinds of projects they take. If you take a really bad project, your company could go under and you could lose your job. So that might make you a little more disciplined if you have debt. On the other side, when you borrow money, you create a conflict of interest. What's good for equity investors and what's good for lenders is not always the same. And you need, there will be costs associated with that conflict of interest, legal costs, agency costs. So that's the real trade-off. And that trade-off actually provides some very interesting implications even before the crisis. The Tax Reform Act passed towards the end of 2017 lowered the federal corporate tax rate in the U.S., from, from 35% to 21%. Overnight, the tax benefit of debt was reduced by almost 40%. Ultimately, U.S. companies were getting tax benefits at the highest marginal tax rate. Post-2017, that tax benefit is far smaller. Holding all its constant, you'd expect U.S. companies to be borrowing less money now than they did in 2016 or 2017. The second is, for a decade or more, companies have been borrowing money as if the good times would never end. Even before the crisis, at least in some sectors, there was an argument that companies had borrowed too much. And this crisis, in a sense, is going to tip them over. So let's look at how to measure the debt burden at companies. Before we decide how to measure the de debt burden, we have to first define what we mean by debt. That might sound like a strange statement to make. After all, in accounting statements, to the extent that you trust accountants, accountants already tell you how much debt a company has. I don't share your trust of accounting, so I'm going to give you the two criteria I look for to classify something as debt. The first is, does the claim that, that, the claim that you're looking at to decide whether it's debt or not give rise to contractual commitments. Commitments you have to meet in good times and in bad times. The more escape clauses and the more flexibility you have, the less you should consider it to be debt. The second is, if you fail to make that contractual claim, do bad things happen to you? Do you go bankrupt? Do you have to turn over control of the business to the lenders? If the answer is yes to both, then you have debt. And using that criteria, all interest-bearing debt is clearly debt, short-term as well as long-term. Accounts payable and supplier credit are not debt, but because of a loophole. And here's what the loophole is. They don't have explicit interest expenses. You think, what are you talking about? When you take supplier credit, usually get a discount up front or better, more favorable terms. By not taking those terms, you're giving up on that discount. That is 
an implicit interest expense. If you're willing to make that implicit expense into an explicit expense, you can treat accounts payable and supplier credit as debt, but it's really difficult to do. All lease commitments are debt. I've never understood why there's even been a debate about it. We can debate what the maturity of the, of the lease debt should be. Maybe if there are escape clauses and renewal terms, I will give you a shorter maturity. Maybe we can debate whether it's secured debt or unsecured debt, but it's definitely debt. Until 2019, accounting allowed <clears throat> companies around the world classify debt into operating and capital leases. And operating leases were allowed to be treated as operating expenses. By the end of 2018, Operating leases were the biggest source of off-balance sheet debt in the world by far. In 2019, both IFRS and GAAP have come to their senses and leases are being treated as debt. It's about time. But I'll actually continue to do what I've done for 30 years, which is to convert lease commitments to debt until I feel secure that accounting is putting the lease commitments on the balance sheets as debt. So let's talk about measuring debt burdens. If you look at the debt due, you can think about the total debt due and you can think about the annual interest expenses you have to make on it. And you can measure the debt burden in one of two ways. You can measure it relative to capital, where you take the total debt due and you state it as a percentage of total capital, either defined in market value terms, but at least the market equity is stated in market value terms or in book value terms. Or you can state debt as a function of operating cash flow. The most common metric to capture this is debt to EBITDA. You take the total debt outstanding and you divide by EBITDA. The higher that number, the more debt you have. If you take interest expenses, you can compute your debt burden using just interest expenses. You can re compute it relative to operating income. In fact, if you divide operating income by interest expenses, you come up with what's called an interest coverage ratio. Now again, with debt, you can define debt either as gross debt, the total debt you have outstanding, or to the extent that you believe that the cash you have in your balance sheet offsets the debt, you can look at net debt. So using those definitions, let's look at where the debt danger is highest and where it's lowest. Here I've looked at debt, debt, both the debt to capital ratios and the debt to EBITDA numbers. And I brought in a third dimension, which is how predictable are the revenues. Let's take the code red companies. These are the companies with the most danger. You have a high debt to capital, you have high debt as a, as a multiple of EBITDA, and you have a very low or negative interest coverage ratio. Your revenues are unpredictable. My question is, what the heck were you thinking borrowing money in the first place? You're in code red. If you have low debt to capital and you have high debt to EBITDA and a low interest coverage ratio, remember, you can that can happen if you have low earnings and you have low revenue predictability, you might not be as exposed as the first group because you have growth potential, but you're highly exposed to distress if capital markets shut down because you're dependent on capital being supplied to get your growth going. If you're a company with high debt to cap, high debt to EBITDA and low interest coverage ratios, but your revenue is predictable, you, you might be able to manage your debt risk, but only if the economy stays okay and you can keep your costs under control. If your, if your revenue predictability is high and you have a low debt to cap and a high debt to EBITDA and a low interest coverage ratio, here again, whether you have earnings growth and capital access will determine how exposed you are. So the orange sector groups are the groups which are where the risk is, is average, maybe in the middle, and the green are the, com are the groups of companies where the risk is lowest. So what you're looking for in your best case scenario is predictable revenues, low debt to cap, a low debt to EBITDA and a high interest coverage ratio. These are the companies where there's actually no danger from debt. You could still be exposed to other dangers, litigation risk, your business could come apart at the seams, but you're not exposed to risk from debt. So with that perspective, let's look at what debt at the start of 2020 look like around the world. I'm going to look at different measures of debt burdens. I'm going to break them down by sector and by industry. And here are the things I'm going to do to kind of lay the table so you know exactly what numbers I'm using. I'm including all interest-bearing debt, short-term as well as long-term, as part of debt. I'm also computing the present value of leases and treating it as debt rather than trusting the accounting numbers. And I'm doing this for, for two reasons. One is IFRS and GAAP might have decided that leases should be debt, but there are chunks of the world, regions of the world where this is still not true. And since I'm looking at global debt, I'm going to do my dirty work myself.
And I still don't trust the accounting lease debt because this will be the first year. 2019 is the first year. Perhaps as we go through time and this becomes universal, I will just replace my debt calculations with the accounting lease debt. But I will also ignore financial service firms in my calculations. And here's the reason. Debt to a financial service firm is less a source of capital and more raw material. I don't even know what debt to a bank is, to be quite honest. So I'm going to look at non-financial service firms, and here's my first breakdown. I looked at the debt de levels at firms broken down regionally. So I'm looking at debt ratios. Debt as a percent of market value, debt as a percent of book value. On a book value basis, U.S. firms have the highest debt ratios. But on a market debt rate basis, they, they, they fall in a much more manageable range. In fact, on a market debt basis, Canadian firms have the most debt. Middle Eastern and African firms tend to have the lowest debt ratios in market value terms, reflecting the fact that at least in much of the Middle East, there is no tax advantage to debt. So it gives you a sense of different debt levels regionally. Broken down by industries, these are the industries with the least debt and the most debt. First, there's a bunching up of lot, lots of technology companies you know, in, in the least debt column and a lot of infrastructure and real estate companies in the most debt column. No surprise there because that's pretty much been the history of how infrastructure companies have funded their capital growth. Maybe it should be different, but that's the way it still is. If you look at debt buffer by region, where how much buffer they have in terms of EBITDA and interest expenses, again, if you look across regions, it looks like J Japanese companies have the most buffer in terms of interest coverage ratios, and the business and Canadian companies have the least buffer. Again, Canadian companies might be particularly targeted because they're natural resource companies disproportionately, but it is a, a sign of weakness if your companies have low interest coverage ratios. Looking at debt buffer by industry, again, you have to look at the businesses with the most buffer and the least buffer. At the top, you have the business with the most buffer. Again, they have quite a few technology companies. Surprisingly, you see oil and gas show up as having the most buffer. And that might suggest what are the weaknesses of what I've done. Both the EBITDA and the operating income I'm using to compute the buffer come from 2019. And given how much oil prices have collapsed in the last five weeks, those buffers might be gone by now. So it'll be interesting to see what those numbers look like next year. Looking at the least buffered sectors, there are a lot of real estate companies. There's one component of oil and gas, the distribution business, and you, ha and you have investment in asset, investments in asset management. Traditionally, investments in asset management have used, has used debt to kind of lever up its equity returns. They're the most exposed industries out there. Again, you know, I'm not suggesting that the businesses with lots of debt are going to go under, but every crisis teaches us lessons, and one of the and these lessons get learned and unlearned. And one and this crisis is a reminder again that debt has a dark side. It makes good times better, but it makes bad times worse. For some of these companies, that lesson will be learned in the most in the worst way possible, which is they will go out of business. For some of these companies, there'll be bumps along the road, and even if they make it through, they will be constrained in what they can do in terms of the investment they can take and how quickly they can grow. And for some companies, especially ones with buffer, which have not borrowed money and have had the capacity to borrow money, this will give them opportunities. Opportunities, why? Because they can take market share away from constrained companies and acquire many of these companies, the most troubled ones, at pennies on the dollar. So one reason to look at debt is not so much to see how much companies had debt at the start of 2020, but to think about how much buffer they have. And if you bring this together with the last session we talked about profitability, what you're looking for are companies which have high profits and low debt. And those companies coming out of this crisis might find opportunities, like every crisis creates. Thank you very much for sharing this session with me. I hope you have a good day.